Hi there, this is Matt Heffernan. Welcome back to my channel. This is the sixth episode of my tutorial series on Z80 assembly language development, targeting the Sinclair ZX Spectrum to learn how to program a simple system starting at the very lowest level. If you haven't seen the first episode, I strongly encourage you to go back to my channel and don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to be notified when the next episode comes out and start this playlist from the beginning. So far in this series, we have learned the basics of assembly language and went over how to move data using all the different addressing modes and learned about branching around with conditional instructions and doing some basic arithmetic. In all of these examples, we've been making use of the stack to preserve register values and call routines, but now we're going to go deeper and see all the different ways that you can interact with the Z80 stack and see how different instructions affect it. As we've seen before, the Z80 has a full 16-bit stack pointer register, named SP for short. This is in contrast to other 8-bit CPUs like the 6502, which only has an 8-bit stack pointer, forcing the stack to fit within a single page of RAM. For the Z80, the stack can not only span multiple pages, but it can start anywhere in RAM and grow to fill up as much memory as you can give it within the 64K address space. For the ZX Spectrum 48K, RAM starts at hex address 4000 and goes all the way to the end of the memory space at hex FFFF. Sinclair Basic places the stack all the way to the end of the free user RAM, but once you go into your assembly code, you can move that stack anywhere that you want, as long as it can grow freely without overwriting any code or data or start trying to push into the ROM segment. Let's take a look at how basic stack operations work. Generally, data is pushed to the stack as 16-bit words, whether that is through pushing register values or calling a routine and pushing the return address. Every push is going to decrement SP by 2 and then store a word at that address. Every pop, either into a general purpose register or a return that will reset the program counter, will take the word from the address in SP, then increment SP by 2. Here we see some code that will push some data to the stack, call a routine, and then pop that data back off. The org statement starts the code at hex 8000, so let's assume going in that the program counter, or PC, is already at 8000, and this code is about to execute from the beginning. At this time, we don't know the values of any other registers or the location or contents of the current stack, but that will change after the execution of the next instruction. At hex 8000 is an immediate load of hex FF58 into HL. This, of course, loads FF into H, and 58 into L, and then the PC points to the next instruction at hex 8003, as this instruction was 3 bytes long. Next we load the value in HL into the stack pointer, and this will reset the stack to start right behind hex FF58, which is where the user-defined graphics characters are, and will remain untouched by the stack. And with our code starting at hex 8000, we have the better part of 32k between the code and the stack, which gives us lots of room to grow both of them. Next, we push the value in HL to the stack, which decrements SP to hex FF56, where we now see that original SP address, FF58. Note that the value is stored as little endian, with the hex 58 at the very top of the stack, and the FF in the next byte. Next, we call the foo routine, which is at hex 8000A, so that address goes right into the PC, and the address of the next instruction, hex 8008, is pushed onto the stack, growing it by another two bytes, and SP is now at hex FF54. Now we go to the first instruction of the foo routine, which loads a new value into HL, replacing that original stack pointer address. But we know it's not lost because we pushed it to the stack before calling foo. So now when we return, the address of the next instruction to execute is popped off the stack and stored in PC, and the stack shrinks with SP going back to hex FF56. Of course, going back to that address will go to the instruction after the call, which pops the old value of HL back off the stack. This will bring both SP and HL back to hex FF58, as the stack is now empty again. The PC moves on to the next instruction, which is a halt, meaning that our execution is done. But now we can see how values and addresses can mingle on the stack, and can help us preserve values temporarily. At each point, we are only dealing with the top of the stack, so the order of operations is very important to prevent the stack from being corrupted. Misplacing pushes and pops can cause a lot of issues, and is indeed one of the most common bugs that happen during development. We've already seen how the call instruction works, not just in the previous code snippet, 
but in most of the videos in this series, especially in episode 4, where we looked at how a call can be conditional or unconditional, and that changes both the syntax and behavior of the instruction. An unconditional call will always result in the routine being called, and the sole operand will be that routine's address, which goes right into the program counter. If a conditional call is taken, the new PC address will come from the second operand. Then, in either case, the stack pointer is decremented by 2, and the address of the next instruction is stored there. This will be the current address in PC plus 3, as all call instructions are 3 bytes long. If a conditional call is not taken, then the stack is unaffected, and the PC will be immediately set to the next address 3 bytes ahead. We've seen the RST instruction in this series as well, which is used to call routines that start near the beginning of memory, which Zilog calls page 0, because the upper byte of the addresses are 0. Rather than using any arbitrary address, like call, RST can only call routines that start at 8 specific page 0 addresses. For the ZX Spectrum, all of these addresses are in ROM, and they each can be used for doing common operations, like we've seen with RST10, which prints the character whose code is in the accumulator. In a later episode, we'll be going over all of these restart routines. RST instructions are always unconditional, and have much less overhead than a call instruction, thanks to only requiring a one-byte opcode and nothing else. Otherwise, the effects are the same as a call, except that the address pushed to the stack is only the address of the RST instruction plus 1 instead of 3. All routines, with a couple exceptions which we'll soon see, end in a return instruction, or RET, which we saw in an earlier episode can be conditional or unconditional. If the return happens, the address for the next instruction is popped off the stack and put into the PC, which also shrinks the stack by 2 bytes. If a conditional return is not taken, the PC is simply incremented and the next instruction code after the RET is executed. The push instruction can put any kind of data on the stack, not just instruction addresses, and the Z80 lets you push any 16-bit general purpose register, including AF, which lets you preserve both the value in the accumulator and the flag states on the stack all at once. Like a call, the word push to the stack is stored as little endian, so if you do a push HL, the L value is stored at the new SP address, and the H value at the next one. A really easy way to crash your code is to do a push and then return before popping, which will send the CPU off to whatever address you just pushed, which is likely not an actual instruction address at all. It's really important that you pop anything you push during a routine before you return, unless you are doing some sort of purposeful shenanigans with a stack. Of course, pop does the opposite of push, and results in a new value being written to the specified register. It can use all of the same registers as push, and the new values placed in the registers do not affect the flags. Unless, of course, you do a pop AF, which will set the flags from the lower byte of the word popped off the stack, and the upper byte goes into A. Misplaced pops can be just as destructive as an errant push, so it's very important to make sure each possible path of execution in your routine has an equal number of pushes and pops before returning, if you want to get back to the expected return address. We haven't really covered interrupts yet in this series, but this is a good time to point out that certain types of interrupts need special instructions to return from their service routines. A mode 2 maskable interrupt must finish its service routine with a RETI instruction, which has mostly the same effects as a regular RET instruction, but it does some internal work to make sure that the processor state is properly reset. Other maskable interrupts can return with a regular RET, as we will see in a later episode that will specifically deal with interrupts. The RETN instruction does the same thing for a non-maskable interrupt, or NMI. The main difference is that if maskable interrupts are enabled before the NMI happened, they will be disabled during the NMI routine, and then re-enabled by RETN, along with restoring the program counter. We'll cover NMIs in the interrupt episode as well. Now that we learned about all of the instructions that can affect the stack, let's take a look back at some of the instructions from previous episodes, and see exactly how addressing SP can let you do more advanced stack operations. Everything we have seen so far in this episode has been dealing with 16-bit words being pushed and popped, as that is what the Z80 instruction set encourages. However, it is possible to push and pop single bytes using the instructions we've covered earlier. Let's define a pair of macros that can push and pop the value of A and A alone to and from the stack. 
First, we'll need a word in RAM that can act as a temporary backup of the stack pointer. Then we'll define the push A macro, which does a single decrement of SP, then loads the new address to the backup variable. From there, we load the address into HL, where we can now do single byte indirect operations. Finally, we load A to this new byte at the top of the stack and the macro is done. Then for pop A, we reverse the process by backing up the stack pointer immediately, then incrementing it. Then we load the old address from the backup into HL and load the popped byte into A. It's important to note that we need to use macros here, as making them subroutines will result in stack corruption. A subroutine would have to do a lot more stack manipulation in order to make the call and return work properly and leave the stack in the desired state. Also, in either case, you'd want to disable interrupts while doing this, as that could result in corruption as well. Another way to manipulate the stack is to swap out the value on the top with a register. The EX instruction lets you do this with HL, IX, or IY. There is no EX opcode for exchanging the values between BC and HL. So we can do a three instruction workaround using the stack. Here we show BC and HL initialized to hex 1234 and 5678 respectively. And then we want to swap those values. First, we push the value in BC to the stack, then do an exchange between the top of the stack and HL. Now the stack has the value that used to be in HL, and HL has the same value as BC. Now when we pop back to BC, it will have the old value of HL. We can do a lot more things like this by using all of these different instructions that can directly and indirectly address SP. Now let's get to our example program. For this, we are going to do another common hack with the stack, and that's to temporarily remap it to another part of RAM to do some quick filling. This can be much faster than doing a loop with incrementing a 16-bit register and doing indirect loads. In this case, we are going to make the screen memory the stack, starting with the bitmap and then the color attributes, and at the end, render a striped pattern on the display. Let's go right to the code. Like always, we start by defining our device and starting address, followed by a jump to the start of our code. In between, we need to define some data, starting with constants for the addresses we are going to be dealing with. The screen bitmap starts at hex 4000 and goes on for hex 1800 bytes. Then the screen color attributes start at hex 5800 and continue for hex 300 bytes. Like we saw earlier, we need to have a backup of the stack pointer in RAM if we're going to be messing about with it. So again, we label it SP Backup. Now our code can start, and what we're going to do first is make sure that the alternate HL register is preserved to allow a graceful return to basic when possible. So first we need to do an EXX to exchange the main registers with the alternates, then push HL to the stack. We'll get it back off the stack and into the alternate HL right before we return from our program. Now we're ready to do our first fill, and we'll start with a screen bitmap. So we load that address into HL. Then we load the pattern we want to fill into DE. By using hex FF100, we'll be able to have alternating 8 pixel stripes of ink and paper. As this will be loaded in little endian, the paper stripe will come first as the low byte is zero. Then we need to store the number of words into BC, which we can let the assembler calculate by dividing the bitmap size by two. The fill finally happens when we call the fill RAM routine which will use these three register values to do it. We'll see how that works later. Next, we do the same thing for the color attributes, with the starting address in HL, the pattern in DE, and the number of words in BC. For this pattern, we want red ink on cyan paper, so filling in each attribute with hex 2A will accomplish this. Another call to fill RAM gets it all done, and now we're ready to return to basic. So we pop the old alternate HL value into the main HL, and exchange it to get it back in the alternate register. This wasn't strictly necessary in this code, as it never changes alternate HL, but it's good practice to do it anyway, and just one more thing that the stack makes handy. And now we can return. Now let's finally take a look at fill RAM and see how we do that. First we need to back up SP in RAM, then calculate a new stack pointer address. We want to have the stack top be just past the segment we're filling, so we add the number of words in BC to the starting address in HL twice, which should get us there. Now we load this new stack pointer to SP, and we're ready to start doing the fill. We first initialize A to hex FF to do underflow detection later, and get right into the loop. 
each iteration, we push the pattern in DE to our remapped stack, then decrement our loop index in BC. Rather than doing a 16-bit decrement, it's faster to decrement just the low byte in C, and only do the decrement of B when the Z bit gets set after the decrement of C down to zero. If that happens, then we decrement B and compare it to the hex FF in A. Once that happens, we know we've gone through all of the words and can stop looping. Then we restore the stack pointer from the backup and return. And that's all our code. So we now just want to return a snapshot named stack.sna using the save sna macro. To make this happen, of course, we have a build script. We just call schasm plus with the lst option to generate a machine code listing, and then pass it the name of our assembly file, stack.asm. Now let's go to the terminal and run it. We run build.sh, and then we'll do a directory listing, and we'll see that the stack.sna snapshot file is there. So let's load it into the emulator. We're using Fuse again, so we hit F3 and select stack.sna and let it run. And now we see the red and cyan stripes just as we expected. You may have also noticed that the pattern was generated almost instantaneously, compared to the slow rendering of most bitmaps on the spectrum. This is thanks to the speed of using the stack operations, which are much faster than using the register indirect addressing that data filling usually requires. So that's all we have for this episode. Next time, I'll be going to more bit twiddling techniques through the use of Boolean logic and other bitwise operations. Until then, keep playing with the stack and see what other things you can do with this example. In the linked GitHub repo, you'll find not only this code, but all of the code examples for each lesson and all of the slides presented in this series. In the README, you'll also find links to some additional materials that can help explain what's going on and provide some needed background in case your programming experience is a bit limited. Please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to be notified when the next episode comes out. And please like this video if you learned anything, and let YouTube know that you want to see more tutorials like this. If you can't wait for the next episode to go public, join our Patreon community and see my videos ad-free as soon as they are uploaded, just like the people you see here. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.